One of the most powerful countries on the planet will elect a new president on March the 4th, 2012. Russia goes to the polls in what the current prime minister, and the most likely victor in that presidential race, Vladimir Putin, has predicted will be a dirty election. In the parliamentary elections held last December, Putin's United Russia party was accused of widespread and systematic election fraud. The largest protests in Russia for 20 years followed the announcement of the results of that election. I was in Russia to monitor those elections as part of a delegation of Western journalists. In this video diary, we show you what we discovered about democracy in Putin's Russia. I work for, I work for a television channel in Britain. There are, there's two ways this can go. Either you can allow us to film a democratic election, or this piece of film of you refusing to let us in is going to be broadcast on British television. Which, which do you prefer? Communism first collapsed in 1989 in Russia's East European Empire. But the shockwaves were soon felt in the heartland of the system. By the early 1990s, the Russian state itself was in an advanced state of crisis. The rule of Mikhail Gorbachev, the man who had begun the process of reform in Russia, ended in an attempted coup by the Russian army. The coup was defeated, but Gorbachev's career and the entire state he headed were at an end. Boris Yeltsin emerged from the political carnage to head the first post-communist government. This was an unprecedented period of political and economic turmoil. As the shock therapy of the free market took hold of the Russian economy, it collapsed by 40%. That is the greatest ever peacetime decline for an advanced industrial economy. Most Russians became poor as industry, land and services were sold off. But some Russians became rich fabulously rich. These were the so-called oligarchs, the get-rich-quick multi-millionaires of the privatized economy. They wielded enormous political as well as economic power. They became used to telling the politicians what to do. Vladimir Putin came to power as Boris Yeltsin's chosen successor when Yeltsin resigned in 1999. Putin is a former officer in the communist era secret service, the KGB. He became head of the KGB's successor, the FSB. Having served two terms as president, he has dominated Russian politics in the post-communist era. Putin built a populist power base by seeming to face down the mighty oligarchs, insisting that they actually paid tax, which is not something that they've been used to doing. But although this strengthened Putin's power and that of the Russian state, the benefits for ordinary Russians were few, and the business elite grew richer still. Putin cut personal taxation to a flat rate of a mere 13%, a huge boost to the super-rich. Corporate tax rates were also generous. It was a deal among the elite. The rich and the corporations could continue to enrich themselves as long as they stayed out of direct interference with Putin's exercise of state power. Even so, Putin's rule could not go on forever. After he was forced to stand down by a law that prevented him serving three successive terms in the top job, he handed over to his chosen successor, Dmitry Medvedev. But Putin did not stray far from the centre of the state. He became prime minister and was widely seen as the real power behind the throne during Medvedev's presidency. Recently, Medvedev stepped aside and nominated Putin to run once again for the presidency in the elections due in March this year. Putin's personal style is aggressive and macho. His favoured publicity shots are those where he practices martial arts and country pursuits. And the style matches the substance. Putin has presided over a newly assertive Russian foreign policy and an economic recovery based to a large extent on exploiting Russia's oil and gas reserves. Domestically, his United Russia Party is nationalistic, intolerant of opposition, and widely accused of electoral fraud. Our team of Western reporters were invited to Russia by an NGO to monitor the elections for the Russian parliament last December. These elections were widely seen as a test run for Putin and his United Russia Party, coming just four months before the presidential poll. Current campaign slogan. Future is with us. Priorities. Modernization. 
tackling inequality, fighting corruption, maximizing Russia's impact in international affairs. Criticized as a monolith that's too slow to react to social change. We were asked to go from Moscow to the Republic of Bashkortostan, a thousand miles to the east in the foothills of the Ural Mountains. The journey to Ufa, the capital of Bashkortostan, takes 31 hours by train. Bashkortostan is oil rich and one of the areas of the country where United Russia is strongest. It is also one of the areas of the country where electoral fraud was expected to be worst. Historically, Bashkiri was under total control. So they ended up being one of the um, major sources of votes uh, for United Russia, for the official party, in a guaranteed way, so that they delivered like 80% of the vote or something for the ruling party. Uh, so, and uh, that was quite above the average in the country. Uh, but this time the situation started changing and uh, the level of protest was much higher but also the level of uh, disorientation and discoordination within the bureaucracy was also much higher. And that's why it seems that the opposition, uh, so-called opposition to be honest, was able to get uh, much more than usually. On polling day, our team of journalists spread out from the capital Ufa to the towns and cities throughout Bashkortostan. Claire Solomon, my fellow reporter and I, headed south to the town of Sterl Tamak. We visited polling station after polling station, where resolute returning officers insisted that there was no fraud and that the electoral process was fair and transparent. By this time, 3 p.m., there were not any mistakes and no breaches of the law, and so this area has no problems. Everything is organized so that voters feel comfortable and everything is clear for them. There are observers from different parties. The parties are sure of their representatives. That's why the system is effective. Although some voters had no criticism of the election process, others were far from convinced. The election is free and fair, and I'm sure that I won't be deceived in any way. In most regions of Russia, they fix the elections. Vladimir Putin does everything possible to help rich people, and he doesn't pay attention to poor ones. They fix elections. I know many people who vote for the Communist Party, and I suspect that more people vote against United Russia, but it wins. And as the polling day drew to a close, videos from around Russia began to be posted on the internet alleging widespread vote rigging by the authorities, which Vladimir Putin denies. This YouTube video appears to show that erasable markers were used in voting booths. One member of our delegation shot this video of a voter entering the voting booth just as we would do in a UK election. But look at what happens next. As the camera pans up, we can clearly see mirrors on the ceiling of the polling station, which allow officials and others to see exactly how this voter is casting his vote. This YouTube video allegedly shows polling station officials filling out ballot sheets. The validity of the footage has not yet been verified. There can be no talk of revising the election results, except for the one and only way set forth by the law. It can be done through court. If there were indeed some violations, the court must hear the case and respond by taking an impartial decision. The State Duma began its work. Now we must focus on the upcoming presidential election. When, they, when they've got the paper from the Territorial Commission, uh, the results from the very same polling station were such that um, Kaparev got uh, 295 votes instead of 285, that was 10 votes plus. Uh, but uh, United Russia got uh, 400 votes plus, uh, uh, totaling uh, to 600 plus votes, out of which uh, 200 votes actually were cut from other parties, <laughs> while 200 votes just emerged out of nowhere. 
And when we arrived at the count in sterile Tamak, the local officials were absolutely insistent that we were not to be allowed to observe the votes being counted. Two rulers inside the counting system in such a way that usually they count more or less accurately at the polling stations, uh, which is not guaranteed though, because this time we've got a pile of cases when uh, at the polling stations level, uh, the situation started deteriorating, uh, partly because probably they were confused about what the goals were uh, at the government level. Uh, but also uh, then uh, documents, uh, so-called protocols, the papers, uh, with vote count, go to the uh, territorial commissions, where they have to aggregate figures from different uh, protocols. Uh, and what happens is that usually when they aggregate, they make mistakes. So they inflate some figures and they kind of cut some other figures. Mistakes. Uh, you see, that's very important. Yeah, but, but mistakes. Uh, like, you see, that's yeah, very important yeah. that they make mistakes. Yeah. I know, that, I insist yeah. on that, because yeah. uh, you see, if you kind of rig votes at the polling station, uh, it's a crime. Mm. If uh, just by some arithmetical mistake uh, you change figures in the final protocol, uh, that just means that your school teacher has to be blamed. <laughs> we showed them that we had all the proper press credentials. They insisted that the credentials weren't printed on the right sort of paper. We're simply attempting to do uh, a, a, a job which any reporter in any democratic country in the world is allowed to do by rights. The police were called, but still the officials would not let us in. I work for a television channel in Britain. There are t there's two ways this can go. Either you can allow us to film a democratic election, or this piece of film of you refusing to let us in is going to be broadcast on British television. Which, which do you prefer? Only momentarily, when they realised they were being filmed, did their resolve falter. But in the end, we were barred from the count. The same happened to all but one of the teams in our delegation. Many believe there is little doubt that fraud was widespread in the Russian parliamentary elections. In some areas, United Russia allegedly received over 100% of the vote. In the Russian army, United Russia received over 80% of the vote. One credible source told us that on the day of the vote, the commander of her friend's army unit lined up the soldiers and showed them how to vote for United Russia. Official and unofficial polls, the results are very different. And the uh, official voting results are also very confusing because you probably already know that, for example, in Rostov and, and uh, Voronezh and Saratov, there are at least uh, three uh, provinces in Russia where the total uh, vote count ended up with 150 or 140 percent of the vote. <laughs> so in that sense, we don't understand what was the real meaning behind that. Uh, and, uh, I imagine that the most massive collapse of the federal government vote was in Moscow and St. Petersburg, uh, but it was also very much so in the Far East, and uh, probably uh, in some uh, parts of the south of Russia. The strategy of United Russia was uh, to uh, create a potential for some kind of broad coalition to cope with the crisis, very much like they did in Italy or in Greece. And uh, to do that, you have to diminish the presence of your own uh, party in the parliament. And note that uh, Putin and Medvedev started speaking about the need for a coalition even before uh, the votes were uh, counted. And actually, technically, there was no need for coalition because if we believe the figures, uh, United Russia has quite a comfortable majority in the parliament. The election results were met with a storm of protest from ordinary Russians. I think this is exactly the Tokyo moment, exactly this uh, bad moment for an authoritarian regime which tries to uh, reform itself and improve itself. And I quoted this uh, phrase by Tokyo quite a few times. Uh, but you see, the irony is that in the West, uh, people go from uh, some kind of political coalition uh, to the possibility to form a technocratic government. What happened in Russia is exactly the other way around. So they first had a technocratic government. We have a technocratic government for all these years. But uh, now what they're doing, they're trying to create a political base for this technocratic government, mm -hmm. and they do it in a very stupid way so that they kind of fail this project. Even as the results were being announced, 10,000 protesters took to the streets of Moscow. Protests also took place in St. Petersburg and other cities. 
Yesterday night, it was a semi-spontaneous demonstration. Uh, about 10,000 people showed up. Uh, most of them were either voters of Yabloka or those people who boycotted the election because they were also anarchists and some other types. And uh, the number of 10,000 for Moscow is enormous because in this city, a number of three or four hundred people coming to a protest is considered to be a huge number. The following weekend, more than 100,000 poured onto the streets of Moscow, again with other protests in other cities. On Christmas Eve, an even bigger protest braved the icy temperatures to renew the challenge to Putin's rule. Such crowds didn't appear in Moscow since the 1990s, actually since the early 1990s. It's a total change of situation. In Leningrad, there were also big protests, mostly dominated by the left, unlike in Moscow, where it was dominated by the liberal uh, opposition. And today, I think uh, there will be more protests because quite a few people were arrested. So people have to go to protest against the rest. And now, quite a few people, like myself, we have to join the protests, like it or not, because uh, we don't like police brutality. Uh, Russian state is definitely radicalizing. An uh, international economic crisis uh, makes a huge impact on the society, uh, both economically and morally. Also, Western protests uh, made quite a few people ashamed. They felt that uh, Moscow was becoming a kind of boring and stupid place uh, uh, out of the whole of Europe, which was moving somewhere. Uh, and that is, in many ways, exactly the kind of emotional reaction of the kids who are running into the square uh, seeing a protest. Because they see, finally, finally, something began, so we have to join in. I'm absolutely certain that this is a watershed, because uh, psychologically, uh, some um, ice is broken. It's absolutely visible what people discuss in the streets while they discuss in restaurants. It's funny, people started discussing politics sitting at lunch in a restaurant. I mean, nothing like that happened before. Uh, in the internet you see the debate, and finally it's in the streets. But uh, it doesn't mean that this is the end of the story, or it doesn't even mean this is the, the beginning of the story, it's a prologue. We contacted the Russian embassy, asking them to respond to the allegations made against them. They have not responded. The old Cold War rivals, Russia and the United States, both have presidential elections this year. Russia's resurgent power in international relations and her grip on oil and gas supplies to Europe mean that the reality of the world in the next few years will be shaped by what happens in Moscow, as well as what happens in Washington. Putin is seen by many as a ruthless and nationalistic leader, but his power is now being challenged by discontent among ordinary Russians. Watch this space.